Australia. Oh, all right. Perfect. We're being recorded now. Um, and Lillian is a visual artist and a former consultant for equity in the curriculum. We will begin by showing a podcast she, was call she has made called Out of the Ashes. Thank you. My name is Lillian Michiko Blakey. This is a story about my family. Out of the Ashes. In ancient mythology, the majestic Oh, it became a symbol of eternal life and fresh beginnings, overcoming the darkness of destruction for many cultures and throughout time. It rises to the challenge to become powerful again and succeed. Its invincibility is a testament to its determination to survive. As such, this is a story of what happened to the 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were forcibly removed from their homes in British Columbia by the Canadian government when Japan joined Germany against us in World War II. Japanese Canadians lost everything their livelihoods, their homes, their businesses, their belongings, but most of all, their identities as Canadian citizens. The unspeakable loss was catastrophic. Like the Phoenix, their story is also about renewal and rebirth. This unspeakable horror had happened to my family, to my grandparents, who came to Canada at the turn of the century and became Canadian citizens, to my Canadian-born parents, and to me, a sensei, a third-generation Canadian. In her memoir, my mother wrote, I was listening to the radio when I heard that Japanese planes were coming to raid the West Coast. I'll never forget that day, December 7th, 1941. It was the worst day of my life. I was stunned and very afraid. Of course, the planes never did come as far as Canada, but they did attack Pearl Harbor, the American base in Hawaii. From that day on, life changed for us. Even though we were Canadians, we were called aliens and treated as the enemy. It was awful. Young people like me had never been to Japan. We honored the British flag, loved Frank Sinatra, and danced the foxtrot. It was hard to understand what was happening. A curfew from dusk to dawn was imposed and we were not allowed to leave the house after dark. I was 19 when war against Japan was declared. The Canadian government forcibly uprooted all Japanese Canadians from the West Coast. Women and children could go to internment camps and men to road camps in the interior of British Columbia. Or families could stay together to work on the sugar beet farms in the prairies. My mother wanted our family to be together, so we decided to relocate to Alberta. Before leaving Vancouver, Eunice sold the furniture but our father's boat was confiscated without any compensation. Father had just cleaned and painted his boat for the winter. He renamed the boat Nancy after Eunice's first daughter. Father was a naturalized Canadian and we were Canadian born, but we had no rights. 
They even took away my little Kodak box camera. We were allowed to take only one suitcase for each person. Everything else was left behind. The government said that we could reclaim our things after the war. But that never happened. In May 1942, we arrived in Lethbridge, Alberta by train and were escorted like convicts by the RCMP. Our clothes were inappropriate for the harsh winter, Alberta winters. We were city people with city clothes. We were fingerprinted and had to carry identification cards everywhere we went. This was the most terrible time of our lives. The farmers who picked us to work on their farms were at the station to claim us. My parents, Rosie and I were taken to Coldale. Eunice's family went to a Hungarian farm in Lethbridge. Mother was worried about separating from Eunice's family because Eunice's three children were so small. So she left us to join them. Then she worried about us, so we got permission for, to leave the Coldale farm to join Eunice and her family to work the sugar beet fields together at the Hungarian farm. Our so-called house was a chicken coop, which was extremely cramped for the nine of us. Eunice, her husband, her three children, my parents, Rosie, and myself. We had barely enough room to cook, eat, and sleep. The room was filthy with chicken droppings all over the place. The window was broken, and orange crate slats were hastily nailed over the opening. An old broken down screen door with cardboard was our door. Mother hung a comforter to keep the cold air out, but it was useless. Coal stove was kept going night and day to keep us from freezing, but we were always cold. We had come from very moderate winters in Vancouver to the very bitterly cold prairie winters, which often dipped to minus 30 or minus 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit temperatures. The farmers were supposed to provide us with proper housing and bedding but this farm provided neither. The bedding were sacks filled with straw. That first winter was excruciating. In summer, it was unbearable inside. There were hundreds of flies everywhere, in our hair, on our faces, all over the walls. Once, as I was talking, a fly flew into my mouth. You cannot imagine how horrible that is. We were spraying the pesticide DDT all of the time, but that still did not kill them off. Today, the government bans this pesticide because once it gets into your body, it cannot be eliminated. I shudder to think about it now, as we had used a lot of it in the 1940s. You cannot imagine more groundbreaking work than a sugar beet farm. We faced many hardships, thinning plants, weeding, hoeing, and finally topping the beets. We rose at the crack of dawn to go out to the field. The beets were planted in thick rows about three feet apart, and when they were about an inch high, we thinned them onto single plants about a foot apart all the way down the rows, row after row after row. We worked until dusk when we could no longer see what we were doing. When we returned home, we did all of our chores, cooking, washing, preparing food for the next day, putting the children to bed. All we did was work, work, work. weeks after the thinning was finished, the farmer cultivated the ground with his horses, and we would go over the whole field, hoeing and 
and pulling out the weeds. If there was a drought, the farmer irrigated the field with water diverted from a canal. Topping started around the end of September. The farmer used his horses again to pull up plow to loosen the soil around the beets. It was our job to pull the beets out of the ground. We took two beets, one in each hand, and banged them together to shake off the soil. Then we cut the tops off and threw the beets into, onto piles as we worked along. Sometimes the soil was wet and it was very heavy lifting. Since it was very sticky gumbo soil, it was exhausting work when caked with mud. I weighed only 90 pounds, so the work was daunting. Even when the weather was awful, we had to keep on working until we had finished the whole 20 acres before winter set in. There were times when the beets that we pulled out of the ground were frozen solid. We worked alongside German prisoners of war who were very pleasant young men. I found out that they could understand French, so we were having a great time. The soldiers guarding them with rifles reported the Germans, so we did not see them again for several days. They were pu punished for speaking to us. There was a barbed wire fence around the field to keep the cows out or to keep us and the Germans in. Eventually, my dad was allowed to join my mom and they were married in Colville, Alberta, where I was born. The rest of mom's family were deported to Japan after the war was over in 1946. My mom and dad refused to go with them. Since they earned only $900 a year between the two of them, it took 10 backbreaking years for my mom and dad to save enough money for the train fare to relocate to Ontario. Here is a story I wrote about my father, African violets and sakura, after we settled in Ontario. All right, um, thank you. Now, if uh, Lillian could say a few words, um, just um, some of your any other thoughts that you have um if you want to give some more context to things that were brought up in the video just pause that okay go ahead uh, I need a lot of people especially in ontario uh knew nothing about what had happened to us and there's an aspect of um of uh, Canadians, you know, who really wanted to believe, you know, that Canada could do no wrong. Anyway, in recent years, you know, of course, there are many things that have been brought to light. And I had asked my mom to, uh, to write her story down, down, and I'm really glad I did that because it has led to change me from uh, a sensei who was denying who I was to taking a, a an activist role in uh, making sure you know that uh, people become uh, aware of what had happened to us and to make sure that it never happens again to Canadian citizens. So I have done you know very uh, different things. Some were um, art exhibitions with paintings and so forth. This was a a, um, a podcast um, 
partly because I think it's really important to try and reach as many different audiences as possible. Anyway, uh, one of the things which I did, I did a, um, a short uh, graphic uh, book about my, my, uh, my grandmother's um, journey as a, as a picture bride and coming here. And I connected with Jeff Chibo Stearns because I had seen his film, um, you know, One Big Hapa Family, and I was really impressed by, by his work. I mean, I could have got somebody from Ontario. But anyway, Jeff answered me right away. And at first, you know, we were, I was thinking, you know, of, an, of animating my, mother, my grandmother's story. But then I decided, you know, that um, that really wasn't fair to Jeff because his interest is, uh, you know, in the, in the mixed race um, uh, identities of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Japanese uh, Canadian uh, children. So, we uh, started working on this, and then he he was so fast in developing. I I just I can't speak more highly of anyone. He is incredibly uh, talented and and um, and just very very focused on what he does. And uh, I'm just blown away by by what he did. The interesting thing about on being uh, Yukiko is that it's an inter intergenerational uh, Japanese Canadian story between a grandmother and her granddaughter uh, at one level, but it also explores many la um, layers, which can be uh, you know which can be explored through the voices of Yukiko and her friends, and I think it's really relevant uh, for diverse cu uh, cultures today, and it's the reality of Canada. Um, but most of all, it validates the identities of mixed race children, the, which are the uh, fa fastest growing demographics uh, in North America today. And it's really, really important for all children to feel that they belong equally to Canada and to be proud of all of their ethnic uh, heritages. So this book offers a way of encouraging children to help everyone learn that we are all related as human beings by sharing uh, the journeys of their own families. So now I'll turn it over to Jeff because he has a whole lot to say about uh, about the book itself. Oh, thank you, Lillian. That's very kind of you. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yep. yep. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, as Lillian mentioned, she sort of just sent me an email um, and out of the blue, um, kind of just sort of, you know, talking about uh, her work and my work and um, expressed how much you know, she had this story um, that you sort of saw snippets of in that last po podcast and how she wanted to bring it to the next generation. And she was really impressed by the work I'd done, obviously with the film stuff um, and trying to make that animated. But um, I think for me, like I said, it was kind of neat to see this as a, as a collaboration, I guess, in that sense. And Lillian, I knew about her work. I've seen your work. It's, it's hanging at the National DK Museum. Um, you know, it's been on the cover of the bulletin. Uh, so it's it's definitely been wide reaching. Even though Lillian is based in Toronto, I'm out here in Vancouver. Um, I'm actually in Kelowna right now uh, visiting my parents. But uh, what was kind of neat about that was that I had always kind of wanted to do something. I've gotten more into doing um, books lately, so so children's books, and I've always wanted to do a graphic novel. And it kind of made sense that Lillian had already prepared all these amazing drawings in her Picture Bride book. Um, that she had done a few years prior and we figured let's try to bring this into a contemporary sense of you know a grandmother telling her granddaughter the story um, of her family history and what was neat about that is that we could get into some of those dynamics of identity especially with someone who identified as being mixed Japanese Canadian so for those who don't know me um, I am mixed Japanese Canadian uh, my mother is Japanese Canadian my father is of European descent um, I've done a lot of work um, that surrounds a lot of my mixed race identity. Um, I did, here I'll hold up these, these, I did a film called What Are You Anyways uh, back in 2005 that explored what it was like growing up in Kelowna, uh, being someone who identified as mixed Japanese and dealing with a lot of sort of strange and interesting experiences uh, navigating my identity um, at a young age, which led me into kind of doing more work. Um, again, did a 
film called One Big Hop of Family. Some of you may have seen this. There's a lot of familiar faces here. Hello to everyone uh, who I recognize. One Big Hop of Family looked at why all of my Japanese Canadian family intermarried after my grandparents' generation, um, which is also reflective of the almost the 95% intermarriage rate that was reported by the National Association of Japanese Canadians, um, looking at um, the high intermarriage rate after sort of that um, sort of second and third generation, um, the fiance and and the Gose generations now are more mixed, uh, much like my cousins and now my children, who I joke as being Hapa 2.0, uh, because my wife is also mixed Japanese. And so now our children are almost the same identical mix as us. Um, but I don't, I always sort of um, shy away from saying half, um, because I feel like fractions can actually be harmful um, when identifying people. So I like to sort of just, you know, uh, identify more as mixed or part of. And I think that's important to help self-identify as part of that sort of DK um, identity as well. Uh, follow that up with a documentary called Mixed Match. Um, some of you may have seen this. Um, it's a film about um, why it's more difficult for multiracial people to find bone marrow donors if you have leukemia or rare blood disease. Um, and then after that, I kind of followed up with this children's book called Nori and His Delicious Dreams. Actually, it was Mixed Critters first, sorry, this one here. This is a book I made for my daughter um, so she could see herself reflected in animals that were like her, also mixed. Um, so there's kind of weird little mixed up, mashed up creatures in here, as you can see. Um, but it was a fun book to kind of get myself into the publishing world. Um, the Nori and His Delicious Dreams was just released this year as well, and it looks at um, a little mixed Japanese boy who dreams of um, sleeping on various foods from around the world. So, you know, he's like sleeping in sushi. And he uh, dreams of eating, or dreams of sleeping in all these great foods. Um, and it, it was sort of a way to encourage kids to want to try different foods from around the world. So when Lillian kind of approached me to do this, this um, project with her, I thought I've always wanted to do a graphic novel because for me, I don't know, I just inherently wanted to always do one. So it just kind of made sense that, uh, you know what, we wanted to reach a preteen audience um, with on being Yukiko. And so we figured, you know, I don't know if you guys know what preteens are into, but they're like hungry for graphic novels these days. And we figured this would be the best way to kind of combine our efforts and sort of showcase both our art styles. So my art style, um, you know, this sort of, uh, sort of Hapanimation uh, style, which was sort of seen in her. Actually, I'm at my parents' house and I framed this for them. But you can sort of see that this is sort of the style. It's a, a mix of um, anime and um, kind of North American cartoon aesthetics. So I joke and call it Hapa animation. Those of you who don't know what Hapa is, uh, it's sort of a, basically it's, it's a Hawaiian word that means part or half and was sort of adopted in North America as a way to sort of, um, for mixed people to self-identify. Um, so they would say I'm Hapa, right? And it usually kind of reflected people who are mixed um, Asian or mixed Pacific Islander descent. So I've kind of joked and called my style Hapanimation as, as a way to kind of you know, capture that kind of um, blending in my own styles. So what I'm gonna do actually, um, I wanna make sure we actually showcase some of the book. I'm gonna actually share my screen with you and I'm gonna kind of flip through some of the pages from the book, uh, talk a little bit about how we came up with some of the dialogue and the concepts as sort of a sneak peek of the book. It's not the whole book, obviously, but um, we are hoping to release the book um, if all goes well. Uh, it should be ready for December, uh, early December. I think a December 4th release. So I'll talk a little bit more about where we're at in terms of um, getting everything together. But right now we've kind of finished our second draft of the book um, and we're getting it reviewed right now. And um, I feel like people are having a very positive response to it. So. I look forward to sharing this with you. I'm going to share my screen. I'm hoping this works. If I could get this all to. All right, are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? All right, hopefully. All right, I'm gonna view and full screen mode. Okay. All right, how's this look? Everyone Everyone can see this? Yeah. yeah. All right, good. Um, actually, this is not the one I wanted to show you. Sorry, I'm gonna pull up another one here, sorry. I wanted to bring up the, or uh, was that the one? Sorry, I thought I had this one all prepped. But it looks like this is not, okay. Sorry, this is the full version. Um, as much as I wanna give away the entire version of the, <laughs> the book, uh, I'm going to instead uh, see if I can pull this up here. Sorry for this short delay here. I'm going to, all right, oh man. You know, like you lose something. 
I feel like I've lost that test version I just had here. So I'm just gonna move something around here. Okay, you know what? Um, that's embarrassing. You guys still with me? <laughs> uh, sorry about this. Um, let's see, is this the one? Oh, this is all 56 pages, okay. I had uh, an edit here that was just uh, part of some of the pages there. And I had it on my desktop. And of course, because of Zoom, making me all paranoid about the way I look on camera, I have since got flustered and lost it as I talk to myself. Um, okay, you know what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just sort of maybe pull up certain pages here. So bear with me, I'm going to just pull up the PDF here. All right, okay. Well, first off, here's the cover. Um, it's surprisingly, the, the first thing that I actually ever did of this book was I made this image. Um, I did the cover of the book because I think for me, um, I wanted to sort of see what it would look like and how it would feel. And surprisingly, it stuck. Um, it's very rare that I've ever done anything that off the first bat, on the first try, it sticks. But this was an image where I drew uh, the main character, Emma, who um, also has a, a Japanese middle name, Ikiko. But she sort of identifies as Emma. She's a quarter Japanese uh, Canadian, uh, Gosei, uh, fifth generation. And I wanted to sort of show how I could combine Lillian's work in there as well. So you can see in the background of this image, there's Lillian's artwork as well. Um, and actually the, um, as I scroll through here, so again, what I did when I started to illustrate the book, and this is kind of a very unique way of going about things. I don't recommend anyone doing this, um, is that Lillian sent me kind of a rough draft script of what she was thinking in her head. Some of the dialogue she had between the grandma and the granddaughter, and uh, obviously her picture bride story that she had. And she sent it to me as a Word doc. And I kind of went through it just in a chronological order. And I would do a few pages at a time. And I would just sort of revise things and I would draw as they came to me. So it was kind of a stream of consciousness. So I sort of started off this, this page with her kind of just, she's, she's in the bed, um, lying there, just sort of thinking to herself a little bit about her own sense of identity. Um, she is a 12 year old uh, mixed Japanese girl. So we kind of wanted to really bring that to the forefront right off the bat. Um, as you can see, as the book progresses, um, she's starting to kind of think about how her mother identifies as Hapa. There's a little joke that she's a Kwapa, um, quarter <laughs> Japanese, or that's sometimes uh, something that uh, we like to joke about. But it also sort of shows how she's breaking herself down a little bit. And we wanted to kind of get her, give the reader a sense that because this is for a preteen audience, you know, we want people to sort of think that at age 12, you're starting to really sort of self-identify a little bit more with your sort of ethnic heritage or your cultural heritage. And um, because of that, um, we introduced sort of the, here's Grammy, which is actually, uh, it is Lillian. <laughs> so it was kind of fun to actually sort of draw a little bit of a representation of Lillian um, speaking to her, her granddaughter. And um, Essentially, it's, it's kind of just sort of progresses through as they have this dialogue together, um, you know, talking a little bit about, you know, I don't look as Japanese as you, why not? And, and how can I have a Japanese name? And then the grandma kind of taking it upon herself to share her family history with her for the first time to essentially, you know, impart this knowledge of her, her history, but also to um, help her develop a sense of pride for, for her, that Japanese Canadian history and roots. So as I kind of scroll through, you can see, um, you know, Lillian's drawings, I start to introduce them and actually they get introduced right about here where the grandmother um, starts to kind of describe the story about how her, uh, basically her grandparents met um, and how they came to Canada in the turn of the century, the 1900s. And so um, both her, her grandparents came from the same region, I believe, right, um, Kumamoto, Japan. But um, they were sort of brought together um, through um, the go-between, um, which was sort of the picture bride process, right? Uh, which I think is, again, a, a story that not a lot of kids know, right? And I think it's really um, intriguing. So you can see as she kind of comes, comes to, and it, it's neat, um, I think for me, when I laid this out, um, this combination of the Hapanimation style that I've developed along with Lillian's style that she's developed as well, which I think is a great way to kind of, again, take us from the present um, to the past. And um, to me, it was a great kind of medium to be able to sort of lay a lot of these images out. So sometimes we have full page spreads. Um, 
we get into things with family history where, you know, the, the, the Lian's Bachan um, is starting to have a family. They're living in British Columbia on the coast. Um, they're starting to kind of build themselves up. They moved to Japantown or Powell Street area, as many know it as. And um, things are good. And then obviously, um, we wanted to kind of pause the book a little bit. So she'll go in and uh, Emma here has a group of friends who also sort of self-identify as being mixed as well in their own way. And they end up getting into conversations about their own mixedness, which I think was really important to have um, a peer sort of element to this as well. So they can kind of break down what Emma's learning about herself. Um, as we move forward, um, Emma, or Grandma continues the story. And much of what um, the story that Lillian has shown in her podcast comes up into the book. So as we kind of come through, obviously there's, you know, the, the propaganda that comes up, um, you know, right as uh, Pearl Harbor is attacked. And um, they decide that they are going to go to Alberta to pick sugar beets. So they board the, the uh, train. Now, you know, I think this is a, a little less common of a story. A lot of times when people speak about the internment, they talk about the internment camps. Um, whereas Lillian's family, um, I think was what was really appealing to this was that it, it sheds light on the other side of the story where a lot of Japanese Canadians were, they chose to go to Alberta to, to work on sugar beet farms, but at the same time, they suffered just as greatly as all the rest of the Japanese Canadians who were interned because they were pretty much put in shacks and um, much of, and still fingerprinted and had to have these ID badges as well. So as the story kind of goes on, it's just a lot about sort of what happens as the hardship. So, you know, Pearl Harbor, or the bombing um, of Hiroshima happens. And then we talk about kind of what happens after with Lillian's family. And what I like about the breakdown between the grandma and the granddaughter is that there is this inquisitive nature that the granddaughter has because she's hearing this for the first time and she's having a hard time comprehending it as well too because it's really a difficult story, right? Of hardship and a lot of the, the trauma that's experienced during this time. And Lillian's um, Bachan and a lot of her family ended up going to Japan after World War II ended and um, suffering a lot as well there. So the story kind of looks at that and um, you know, it kind of comes together in the end where you know, we, we bring it up to the present day and um, we even talk a bit about the redress as well, um, because we want to make sure that we include a lot of the aspects that um, were triumphs also for the Japanese Canadian community after World War II, and that was very important that we had discussed that. But the one thing that we end on is that her, uh, Yukiko and her friends decide that they want to take it upon themselves to learn more about the history and um, their own histories, and a little bit more about um, basically um, breaking down, I guess, identity and you know, systemic racism and stuff as well, too. So we wanted this to be very, we talk about third culture kids as well. We talk about white privilege, you know, in not ways that are very expansive, but we want to at least touch on it so that this generation can start to form some dialogue um, in relation to what happened during World War II. So I might leave it there because I want to move into the, the Q&A portion of this and make sure we have this open for questions. But we are very excited about, um, you know, what's happening. We want to thank... Um, Right now, we, we have six Japanese Canadian associations who've come on board to help um, with the support of the book, um, including Victoria uh, Group, uh, The Seven Potatoes, uh, Manitoba, Calgary, Edmonton, and Toronto. Um, and I'm not sure, I think Lorraine, are you on, she's on here. We did get some good news back from the NAJC yesterday. I'm not sure how much we can disclose on that or anything else. But we, what I wanted to say is that we've had great support from the Japanese Canadian community for our book. Um, Joy Kogawa just sent a really lovely quote. Um, if you know Joy, she wrote Obasan um, about uh, on being Yukiko. And so, um, yeah, we've been really fortunate that the book has so far in the early stages of preview um, gotten some really great feedback. And uh, some of you actually on this um, Zoom have had a chance to preview the entire book. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. So for those that are interested, um, I want to just preface this the last thing is by saying, um, you can actually uh, pre-order copies of the book now um, at meditatingbunny.com slash store. Uh, this will secure that you're gonna be the first people that will receive a copy of the book in the mail. Um, and essentially, like I said, the, the copies were really aiming to have this book finished before Christmas so that people will get some early Christmas presents. So I think December 4th is when the book will be printed and ready in our hands. 
Um, and all copies that uh, you will receive, I'll, I'll have signed at least. Um, we'll get Lillian to get a bunch too if she wants to send those out to her friends. So we'll be able to sort of sign them, um, get them to all of uh, the young ones that are in your families. So if you want to help us out, um, the pre-orders help us just afford the cost of the printing because we're printing the book in Canada because we find that's very important as well. Um, but we need to do a large batch of copies, so it's not going to be cheap. So that's why we've solicited the, the help of a lot of these organizations um, uh, to help us with sort of the cost of that, because we are independently publishing the book. Uh, we felt it was really important that we wanted the book to be out soon and fast and quick uh, into the hands of people. If we go through a publisher, it usually takes three, four years to get a book out. Um, we've actually streamlined this. It'll, since conception, I think it's taken us maybe six months. Right, so that's pretty unheard of, I think, for any kind of book to, to, to come out that quickly. But um, we are doing our due diligence and making sure that we have the proper reviewers and, and people reading the book for historical accuracies and such not, or everything as well too. So yeah, if you wanna help us out, you can pre-order at meditatingbunny.com slash store. And uh, that just helps us uh, basically get those costs of the printing um, um, kind of secured. Um, so we can go to the printers. I think November the 2nd is the printing deadline. So it's all very exciting. It's moving forward. And um, I'm looking very forward to um, to getting back to uh, questions here. All right. Am I back to me? You don't see my, my screen yeah, anymore? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Perfect. So let's begin with um, these. I have prepared four questions to ask um, the both artists. Uh, Shall we begin with Lillian? You good? You ready? Okay. <laughs> In the context of your heritage, how do you identify? It's uh, sort of interesting because um, all my life, uh, I, I sort of denied who I was as a Japanese Canadian because my parents didn't speak of what had happened so that I assumed that whatever had happened was bad. And I really only learned about um, our, um, our, our history after the redress was signed and my mother wrote her story. So while I say that I identify as Canadian, I am really, really interested in, uh, in embracing you know, my Japanese heritage, even though I no longer speak the language or uh, participate in, in um, uh, you know, any of the cultural activities. So I think, it's really, really important, you know, to, um, I guess it's making a statement through books like this, you know, to teach uh, the, the future generations that it's important to embrace all of who you are and to be proud of who you are. And so while I'm very proud of, uh, you know, being Japanese Canadian and I, and I identify that way through my work, but then if somebody asks me, what's your nationality, I would say Canadian. And I think maybe if we get rid of all of the tribalism, that eventually we will all think of ourselves as Canadian. Oh, I think uh, you're still muted. So a second, there we go. And uh, and Jeff, um, in the context of your heritage, how do you identify? Yeah, I, I think uh, as mentioned before, um, I identify as mixed Japanese Canadian. Um, you know, obviously. Uh, that's, that's played a, a bigger role in my life later on. Um, I think growing up, I struggled with it quite a bit. Um, and I had some slides about that earlier, but I, I decided that I'd want to focus more on the book. But I, I think, you know, I've had those experiences growing up where, you know, I brought sushi to school and none of the kids ate it because they thought it was weird and gross. Um, and I'm mixed Japanese, you know, so that, that's difficult when you think about um, the context of, of some of those things. But I think as I've gotten older and I've focused more of that in my work, I've been able to explore that more and, and dissect it. Um, it's helped me build more of myself up as someone who identifies as, you know, DK or, you know, Japanese Canadian. And in realizing that as mixed as we are, um, we can still self-identify as much as we need to be, right? So, you know, I, I think that's important for a lot of this generation uh, to know that, um, you know, even if you are quote unquote a quarter or an eighth, um, you know, we can still embrace that that cultural heritage um, and, and as much as you need it to be um, and be embraced by the community as well, which I think is really important because as we are moving forward, you know, we are getting more mixed and mixed and blended. And even after my grandparents' generation, no one else married in the Japanese community except me and my wife, um, you know, so, um, you know, it, it was unintentional, it just happened, but, uh, you know, if you watch What Are You Anyways, you'll find out how that all, all panned out, right? But, uh, 
yeah, I think, you know, just, just mixed really. Um, and I, I, I think I should preface this by saying we did start Hapapalooza in Vancouver, which is a, a festival that celebrates multiracial identity. Um, and it's something that had been going on since 2011. Actually, John uh, Endo Greenaway, he, he's right there in that little box, helped us do a lot of the design work early on. Um, so I think, you know, it's been really great to involve the community within this process where we can celebrate the multifacets of how much make us up to be whole, um, but also celebrate all the parts of us um, that we are um, and celebrate that. So that's what the Happy Blues is. But like I said, I can still feel like I can, you know, have this fluidity to be able to talk uh, and, and involve myself in the community in this way. Sorry, long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll continue with you for the next question, uh, Jeff. And when and how did you learn about your family history? Well, you know, I guess it was more when I did one big HAPA family. Um, for myself, we were some of the only few, I think it was two or 3,000 Japanese Canadians that weren't interned because we were already um, established in the Okanagan area. Not saying that my family didn't escape a lot of, you know, the hatred and racism, but at the same time, um, it was a different history. Um, one that I had to sort of explore a lot more when I did the documentary. And also learn a lot more about the other, you know, 22,000 Japanese and Canadians that were interned, um, which really opened my eyes to that because I didn't know a lot of that story because it wasn't told to me. Um, and it wasn't my history as well. So I think when, what's great about like working with Lillian is that I'm able to embrace that story as well um, in a collaborative way. Um, so it's not so much my history, it's collaborative history um, and, and also sort of my own take on identity as well which I think is important, you know, because there are multiple histories that happened during World War II and, you know, mine might've been a little more rare um, because we were the minority in that sense. But also, you know, like I said, it's, it's complicated, um, you know, because there is a little bit of animosity there, I think, you know, back when redress happened, you know, with what this community in the Okanagan um, should experience in line with, with those that had all of their property taken away, right? So, um, again, complex, complicated, but a lot of it got explored in one big Hapa family. Thank you. And Lillian, uh, when and how did you learn about your family history? Well, I really uh, learned about it in bits and pieces. Um, um, you know, I was uh, six before we moved from Alberta to Ontario, and my, fa my parents had some friends here, and they used to get together every Saturday night, but they'd be speaking in really, really quiet, hushed tones so that I assumed that it was a secret that was bad and you know at six I was you know really too young to understand everything but I they kept on saying tash me tash me tash me because I think that's where a lot of their people you know had gone and they were looking to see what had happened to their friends so when they got together it was like you know have you heard about so and so and so and so so really, I didn't, you know, I'd be sitting there watching TV and not really paying too much attention. But um, it was really when, when after the redress, you know, when I asked my mother to write her story, that I realized how horrible it really was. You know, as children, you go through these things, but as long as you're loved and looked after, you don't really think it's horrible. So it's bits and pieces. And then in 2001, I did my first painting, the one of myself, you know, um, in front of the bar, uh, behind the barbed wire fence with my mom working in the field. But that was 2001, but it wasn't until 2012 before I put together a, an exhibition of work and I showed it at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center. And, and I was really sort of nervous because I thought maybe the older people would be really upset but they weren't. What they, what they did was they came up to me and they had tears in their eyes and they said, that's exactly what happened to us. So I, I, I really felt that it, it's my responsibility because I can do it uh, to tell the story in visual ways. I know a lot has been written, but there are, I think with, with uh, visual um, uh, works, you know, it's, it's, it, the immediacy is right there in your face. And then I decided to show in mainstream galleries as well, because, you know, people, we know the story, but people who aren't Japanese Canadian needed to know the story too. And that's what I've been doing. And I really hope that I can get this, um, this uh, graphic novel into, into, uh, into the schools. And 
you know, I will be contacting both of you in terms of, uh, you know, your curriculum and, um, you know, whether, uh, you know, what we produce. And I am writing it with the former uh, director of education for uh, TDSB, which is uh, Donna Kwan. And um, we'll, we'll uh, put it out for reviews and, and see what you think. Sounds great. Um, and so continuing with uh, Lillian here, how has this influenced your art? Oh, a big way because, bef you know, when I went to university, uh, the focus was only on Western art. And there was this feeling that they didn't even accept art that was being produced in Asian countries. That it was sort of a secondary afterthought if you wanted to take, you know, uh, uh, Far Eastern studies or whatever. And so that for a long time, uh, you know, my art was all, uh, you know, with uh, Western themes and, and so forth. And I did nothing, nothing on my Japanese Canadian heritage. And as I said, 2012 was the first time. And now that's all I do. Glad to hear it. Um, and Jeff, um, how has this influenced your art? Yeah, I think as mentioned in, in all the books that I do and all the films that I do, it has a heavy, you know, emphasis on identity, um, especially because of my upbringing and dealing with a lot of experiences. But also, I think I've gone to a lot of conferences on mixed race identity as well. So, you know, I realize there's a great thirst for this media, um, because especially as we're moving forward into the future, there's just more and more and more mixed kids. Um, you know, if you look at the Hapa groups and the Hafu groups on Facebook, you know, there's thousands of members, right? and it's only gonna keep growing and growing and growing. So I know for myself, it's important that we share these stories. It's important that I share you know, my own personal experiences and stories to help others be inspired to tell their own stories. Um, I think that's really important. And um, you know, like I said, I'm really fortunate this community has embraced um, the work that Lillian and myself have been doing um, because I think we're tackling from diff two different perspectives as well, right? Um, each from our own sort of generational standpoint, right? Knowing that Lillian has a rich history um, with her own family um, and also with myself um, now being mixed Japanese, you know, I have a different perspective on the way I'm sort of um, I guess, sort of moving forward um, through my own art making. Um, but again, I, so, I, so I mean, I think on being a Kiko, for me, I'm really excited about because this is the book I've wanted to do for years, um, you know, with this intergenerational sort of story with the land. Because again, bridging the gap between these generations is rarely ever done. And I know it's becoming a really important discussion point in the community because people are feeling like a lot of the kids aren't self-identifying as part of the community anymore, the Japanese Canadian community, because they may only identify as a quarter or an eighth. Um, and they may not look Japanese Canadian anymore, right? Um, you know, luckily I think, you know, we're seeing that a lot of families are supportive. Um, we are sharing our stories. We are, um, you know, basically, you know, and, and creating more media like this is really important. So I think, you know, my own cultural heritage has really influenced and impacted my art making for sure in all mediums of film and books. Thank you. And final question, um, start with Jeff again. Um, how do you hope this novel will help readers explore their roots and become more interested in their own heritage? Yeah, I think, you know, it's just the, the sharing of stories. Um, it always boils down to storytelling. Everything I've ever done is about storytelling, whether, whether it's film, books, um, or anything else, podcasts, or, you know, sharing anything. Um, because, and that's, to me, is, you know, the, the main message here is just how are we going to continually keep sharing these stories with each other? And, it, you know, I hope this book, um, inspires and influences other families to sit down with their kids, sit down with their grandkids and share those stories, those intergenerational stories. Um, and that, I think for us, everyone who's read the book um, has felt that, right? That this is a really important way to bridge that gap. And I found that with One Big Hapa Family, the documentary, a lot of uh, parents um, of mixed kids would tell me, you know, thank you for making this film because it was so hard for me to talk to my kids about their own mixed race identity because I myself am not mixed. You know, I am full Japanese Canadian. And so it gave them an in um, to this conversation. And that's all we want to do is create this dialogue and discussion with, with these, these families. Um, and as long as we can do that, we've, we've done our job. Right, Lillian? <laughs> right. <laughs> and Lillian, um, how do you hope this novel will help readers explore their roots and become more interested in their own heritage? 
Well, I really do have one obsession, and that is to get it into the school boards so that all uh, teachers will have access to this. And what I found, it's not just a Japanese Canadian story. We use that as, a, as an introduction to uh, issues that probably most um, uh, immigrants have. It's not the same story, but it, they also have issues of, of uh, you know, going to a different country and being accepted so that it, it provides a, a safe way for parents to begin to talk about their own family when they look at a family that, uh, that, that isn't theirs. So that if you show it in the school, like there are very few Japanese Canadian uh, children in the school system, especially here, so that uh, nobody would feel as if they're targeted you know, it's embarrassing for 12, year, 12 or 13 year olds, you know, if you focus on their culture and, 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 and so forth. So that this is what my hope is that, um, that uh, you know, what happened in the States with those Mexican children never ever happens here. And it's really, really important to, um, I think it, it adds validity to the citizenship strand. Because, you know, a lot of kids say, oh, citizenship, they just take it for granted. You can never take it for granted because it can happen really quickly as we see in the States. Thank you. Um, those are, my questions are finished, but um, I'll open the board to um, our, our audience. If you have any questions, um, please, please feel free to put that into the chat um, and um, you can read it out to, the, to our, our artists. I'm gonna read this all the way. Um, there's some, uh, we had one earlier um, about U.S. distribution uh, for the book. Just want to confirm. Um. Yeah, I, I think um, in regards to distribution of the book, um, because we're independently publishing it, um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to get distribution for the book and get it widely out there. So um, I do have a distributor I work with here actually in Kelowna, um, and they get us into, hopefully we'll get us into Chapters and Indigo and, and some of the bigger outlets. Um, also, I've worked closely with Amazon. Um, I'm not a huge fan of their business practices, but at the same time, in terms of books and getting out there, especially in the US, um, Amazon is one of the major suppliers of books. So um, that will be an option as well. And as Lillian mentioned, we really want to get this into the school system. So we're going to be pushing very hard by creating curriculum and um, lesson plans and everything else to um, entice um, teacher librarians and teachers to, to take the book on, you know, and especially districts as well. Um, because this is a story that, you know, is sometimes difficult to access and isn't always told. Obviously, we've had books like Joy's um, with Obasan um, in school curriculums. But at the same time, this is for a preteen audience. Um, you know, we wanted to make this as colorful and the art as appealing as possible so that kids will want to pick this up. They'll want to read through the whole thing. They'll want to learn more about um, their histories and this history. So um, we made sure that, you know, we, we've taken the proper steps um, to make sure that this book isn't just going to be something that, you know, we're just selling out of a backpack, but actually we're going to get this out into the world properly. Um, which is why it was important we do a big run of books um, in the very beginning. Um, and then just continue to keep rolling it out, rolling it out. So a lot of time will be spent on marketing promotion um, post release. Thank you. Um, John Greenaway, he uh, says, love the way the two illustration styles are used throughout the book. Can you talk a bit about the, that process? Um, I yeah, well, Lillian, maybe, because uh, you started the Picture Bride um, as a, uh, kind of a story for your grandkids, right? Do you want to maybe talk about that and I'll transition into how, how this developed? Yeah, I also uh, used it uh, in classrooms, um, you know, when I've been asked to go and, uh, and, and to speak to the kids. Instead of just talking to them about it, I put it on, uh, on uh, PowerPoint. And it was really, really well received by, uh, the ki uh, by uh, Normie Bookie's kids. Um, he's a teacher, but he also runs Discover Nick Cape. And it was just incredible, the questions that they had and the insights that they had. And uh, so that, that was really my primary focus because we know that kids don't wanna read these huge books or if they do, they're forced to and, and so forth. We wanted them to get excited about seeing something. And so that's where it started. And uh, now with this, it's, uh, it's even much better much better because we get a whole lot of um, 
of um, layers of, of things, you know, that uh, teachers can choose to uh, explore or not. Hmm. And I think it gives them flexibility. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like I said, it's, there's something really, I, I actually printed out every page when I did it. I would do one page, I printed out, and then I would, I constructed my own um, version of the, the graphic novel just so I could hold it in my hands and have something tactile that I could flip through. And this really helped me, you know, realize that, oh, wow, look what we're making. We're making a physical, you know, book um, that is appealing. And I think for me, it was really important that we had a really cool color scheme with the book as well. That Because Lillian's, you know, illustrations, as you can see here, you know, have this sort of bluish sort of tinge to them, but they're also very sort of sketchy and realistic. Whereas I wanted to contrast that obviously with the style that I've developed with that half animation style, which is a bit more cartoony, right? And, um, you know, I think for me that that's really um, made it fun. Um, it's, it's been a fun collaboration because when I laid the book out, you know, like I said, it was page one to page 56. I did it in order. And I'm really lucky that because we were going to end on 56 pages that um, we made 56 pages because I didn't know where the story was going half the time. I even, I, I sort of um, admitted to Lillian that I didn't even read through the whole script as I was doing this because I wanted it to be an exploratory process for me. And I wanted to kind of come to the end in a way that I felt was logical, not contrived, um, you know, because we needed to find a way that, and that's why even when you look at the art in the very beginning, to me, I don't know if you'll notice, but you know, it starts off a little different and it kind of actually, um, what would we say, it sort of, uh, it, it, it evolves um, as we go. But again, that for me kept me motivated, kept me moving forward with the story. And I think that was just a fun collaboration, you know, and being able to take Lillian's drawings and find a way of kind of mixing them together with mine and uh, looking at how we're doing the paneling, right? The, the progression of the paneling was always interesting when you look at, you know, for example, this page here, right? You know, sort of like, you know, Lillian's drawings are very first and forefront in a lot of these, these images and, or, the dialogue between the grandma and the granddaughter just sort of, um, it helps, helps the story along. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tammy Hirasawa, uh, she asks, can Lillian talk about the process, how she takes photos and incorporates them into her artwork? Gee, you know, I did these so long ago. <laughs> Of course, you know, some of it uh, we have referenced, you know, when I used, um, because, you know, I can't imagine everything like Japantown or, or whatever. So I had to, uh, you know, find images, you know, that I could turn into illustrations, uh, you know, for the, for the accuracy. I couldn't just make up something. So it's, it's a combination of doing a whole lot of research and finding out about, uh, you know, different, um, uh, you know, uh, pictures that I wanted to show, uh, as well as to uh, tell my mother's story. So it's, it's, it's really funny because there were days when I could do three or four illustrations in one day, and then, and then I would get stuck, you know, <laughs> and not do anything for a few days, because it's, it's a process of, of thought, you know, and how you want to, uh, to um, illustrate it. So yeah, I was, uh, you know, using, um, you know, a lot of but I did use different papers. Some have textures which show through, you know, the, um, the um, illustration and others don't because I wasn't even thinking of publishing this. It was really uh, intended, you know, for my grandchildren um, as something, you know, that they could, they could relate to when, when talking about our family story. So it too evolved. <laughs> What I should say too, this is really interesting. This is the first time I've ever spoken to Lillian face to face, ever. <laughs> um, we've only ever spoken on the phone. Uh, we've never met in person. Um, and it's, it's been a really interesting collaboration in that respect too, because we've had, you know, four hour phone conversations, but we've never actually seen each other in this um, space where we can actually speak to each other face to face. We're hoping one day we will get to, to meet in person, but I think that's a true testament to how we can work together um, collaboratively from across the country, right? Um, that we don't need to be in the same city. You know, we can be from different cities and I think um, especially from different generations as well too, which has been really fascinating. So yeah, I guess that's, that's I just wanted to, to make a mention of that because I think that's really interesting, you know, when we think about the fact that we've never actually met in person, but we know of each other's work um, and we admire each other's work. And I think that admiration comes through in the way that we collaborated, you know, whereas 
some days I could do three or four pages a day and some days I can only do one. Right. So, um, you know, same way with Lillian, it's just sort of a way that the, the sort of images came together, but we you know we've done our due diligence and, and we have you know, the Nikkei National Museum has been very good um, with um, helping us source um, the references for the photos as well. So um, we want to make sure that we've uh, credited and thanked everyone who has had a, a part of this book, um, especially the organizations and especially those that have helped us review the book and um, had early access to the book to help us uh, guide us a little bit in, in some of, um, you know, the history as well. Um, because like I said, we want this to be an important resource that's going to basically be evergreen. It will last forever um, and be something that, you know, kids 20 years from now can pick up and read and feel like this is a fresh new story um, that obviously is, has historical value, but also has contemporary value in terms of the, the language around mixedness and being mixed race. Uh, thank you. Um, we're past time, but we have one more question, um, possibly another. Um, so if, if you have to go, feel free to leave. Um, uh, no hard feelings. But I'll, I'll ask us an, um, one more question from uh, Vivian Vignesak. Hi, Vivian. <laughs> um, thank you, Lillian, for pointing out the universality of being Hapa and how this could lead to discussions in homes and schools about understanding and 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 pride in family heritages. So what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, how this universality of being Hapa, um, how it can lead to discussions in homes and um, does Vivian wanna? Oh yeah, because I mean, look at the diversity in front of us, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, people, are, are uh, getting married to, uh, you know, people, people that uh, you never would have even have dreamed of, you know, 10, 10, 20 years ago. So I think it's really important. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is that, you know, when, when I field test this in schools, I think that maybe Jeff and I could work on a follow-up, you know, of what the kids produce and what the kids have to say. See, I'm springing this on you, Jeff. <laughs> well, you know what, I, 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 we're in it for the long haul, you know what I mean? Like, I don't make just, I don't create projects just to kind of throw them out there. You know, we're going to spend a lot of time and energy uh, making sure that we have um, the proper resources in place to make sure that this is going to be effective in schools and teach and educate and inspire. Um, because I think for myself as an artist and Lillian as an artist, we want this to inspire kids to want to create their own art, their own comic books, their own graphic novels. Um, you know, so I think, and like I said, everyone in the, who's, who's answered and looking at the questions and the comments, you know, thank you so much. You know, this means a lot to us um, because being embraced by the community is something we really, um, you know, take to heart. And, you know, to have that support, you know, from John and the bulletin and everything else, you know, we, we want to be involved. We want to have as much, um, you know, so much surrounding this novel that it just, people know about it. You know, people are aware of it. And, uh, you know, it always starts at the grassroots level, you know, and, and with this presentation with, with the Victoria Society here, it's, this is where it starts, you know, it starts at that grassroots level, getting the word out there, um, spreading the word, getting it out there. And, and I think that's really important, you know, and all the way up to the national level of the NAJC, um, Lorraine, I see you're on here. And, and again, you know, we, we found out we got some support from them as well. So, you know, we're really, that, that, that to, to us means the world, you know, and I think, um, luckily, I think where we're at now, um, we have raised enough that we can cover the first printing of the book, which is exceptional. You know, it took us some time, but we got there. And it, we got there because the communities in this, the Japanese gaming community supported us. You know, they believed in the project. They believe in us as artists. And I think, you know, for, for artists, you know, that's a great validation, you know, to have that support. Um, and I know for Lillian and myself, you know, that has meant the world because, you know, it's one thing to just make something but it's one thing to actually have it accepted and embraced and um, distributed amongst the community. So um, we've had nothing but support, love and admiration for it. And, and that means the world to us. So thanks to all of you who are on this conversation with us who have supported us in any way, whether it's just in the past, present and will be in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff and Lily. I just wanted to add uh, a comment and it was to do with the, the historical accuracy. And, and when we were going through this process, uh, we had some of our members from the Victoria Nikkei Cultural Society offer uh, some input on the, on the Japanese phrases that were being used. And 
really, really want to thank Jeff and Lillian for being so open to uh, all, to those suggestions and so making sure that it was very uh, realistic and, and uh, accurate. So, so thanks very much for that. Oh, we thank your people for doing that because uh, you know I, Jeff and I do not speak Japanese, so <laughs> <laughs> so it was like finding it online. <laughs> Anyway, I do want to thank both of you for, for doing this. I mean, you've been such great supporters. And, um, and uh, you know, I will keep in touch with, with what happens with the educational uh, part of it and, and so forth so that you can review that and give your um, input as well as to what you want to see uh, out there. For, uh, for teachers to use. And especially now, you know, I mean, the uh, teachers are going to be mandated to, uh, to do anti-racist education in their classroom. And a lot of teachers do not have any idea how to do it. So we hope that this book will lead them into it. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, think, I, I think you can, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and it, just for, you know, um, I think uh, there's also a pre-order through the Victoria Association as well, or through the website, um, however you want to get it. Awesome. But again, um, there'll be a big launch, you know, once once it, it comes out in December. But um, again, um, I think we're still looking for a little bit more. So that's the best way to support us or have others if you want to let them know. Um, just the pre-orders are always the best way to help get the buzz going. So thanks. And uh, Tami Hirasawa says, uh, where can we, thank you so much, uh, where can we access, share this recording? Uh, I believe that um, the recording will be posted TBD. Uh, we're not, other communities will also have a chance to, who also support the way VNCS has supported, they'll have a chance to um, host their own presentations. And so we don't want to post ours and have that conflict. So um, I believe the posting of our recording will be held until further notice. <laughs> so um, perhaps just follow along in the newsletter, uh, the VNCS newsletter that will, we will definitely make a post there um, when we'll be um, publishing the, this recording. Um, and um, I will hope that um, Jeff and Lily and uh, their social medias um, um, will also um, announce when <laughs> if uh, these go public. And um, there was another. I should also mention too. Yeah. Oh, if you want to, um, Instagram, uh, social media is a great way to keep in touch with us. Um, but we're at uh, on being. I'm putting this in the comments. You keep going. So you can find us there. We're on Facebook under On Being Yukiko. We're going to start a website. Um, everything, the wheels are in motion. But social media, if you follow us um, on Being Yukiko, um, that's the best way to just sort of update, keep us keep updated on our progress um, and on more presentations. Um, again, most of the other societies that have supported us, uh, we will be doing presentations with them in the future. Um, so this won't be the only presentation. And uh, once chances are those presentations will happen after we publish the book. So we'll have a chance to um, talk about now that the book is in hand and, and a hard copy. The books will be hard copy editions, the first edition. So they'll be really nice. Um, they'll feel really good as you hold them in your hands. Um, and again, um, we're do, we'll do our best to kind of draw something or write something in there for people who have pre-ordered. Um, and if you want them made out to anyone specific, just, just make sure they mention that in the uh, comments and stuff too. So um, but yeah, I, I, I can't thank everyone enough for, um, for all of the support. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, but there's been lots of lovely comments um, uh, saying thank you and what people are thinking about uh, specifics of this project. So um, just so everyone's aware, I'll make sure to save this chat and um, forward it to both uh, Jeff and Lillian. I think there's been um, someone with some contacts with um, uh, the okay. school school curriculum system. So um, I'll definitely be sure to forward the chat to them. So they'll be they'll have a log of the chat and be able to see your lovely comments as well as your contact information for that. Uh, I feel oh, like Deborah. Can I just make a mention? Sorry, um, yeah, Lorraine. Uh, we, I guess we can mention Lorraine. Thank you. Um, the NAJC has given us an endowment fund. I wasn't sure if we're allowed to share that yet if it was public knowledge, but um, the yeah we did receive a, a very generous endowment fund um, to help uh, with the publication of the book. So thank you to the NAJC. Um, big, big thanks. Um, and Kawadu also asked, is there going to be a possible uh, edition in Japanese in the future? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Although you're, this is the, the, the funny thing that Lillian mentions is it's two non-Japanese speakers, right? Um, and that's very common um, for the Sansei, Yonsei, and Gosei generations. We just didn't learn the language. Um, even my mom didn't learn the language. So um, if we do um, do that, we will rely heavily on the community for that support. Um, but of course, one step at a time, um, if there is demand for it, for sure. It's very easy to put um, Japanese um, language, although I'll have to flip the book the other way, right? Because <laughs> that's the only, uh, uh, that might take some work. But um, you know what, if there's enough demand and enough interest for it, I would love to do that. Um, again, it just boils down to resources, time and energy. Um, Lillian and myself, it's all sweat equity. You know, we haven't received a single dime for ourselves. Um, for this book, um, you know, that might come later when we start making some sales. But for now, we've relied heavily on, on support from the community to help publish the book, right? Um, and that's where the hard costs are going is to publish the book and get it out there. So, um, you know, this is a labor of love for Lillian and I, you know, we're doing this out of the goodness of just wanting to get these stories out there and to help, um, you know, bridge the gaps between generations. Um, you know, and I think that's, if there's more of us out there that do that, we're going to be in a good place in the future. So. Um, and uh, Amil, uh, Elmira S, sorry if I mispronounced that, um, how will you manage to get um, the book into the curriculum of schools? Um, how is the relationship with teachers? Um, well, I'll leave this to oh. Lillian, but you know what's good about Lillian and I is we, we're both um, you know, high school teachers. I taught high school for a year, a couple of years. I have an education degree from UBC. Um, I taught college level animation for a while. And Lillian, you can talk about your experience as, a, as an educator as well. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with Ontario because that's, you know, I still have um, a lot of uh, uh, actually leaders in, in, in uh, you know, in, on the executives of uh, different boards that were uh, teachers that I worked with, uh, you know, when I was, uh, when I was a consultant so that, uh, I will uh, present it first to them and then it's going to take a, a little bit of time because, you know, everybody's going to want their two cents worth in there and to make changes, whatever it is, you know, but we're going to, we're trying to, to deal with most of the changes now before it goes into print. And this is why I've got it out to uh, reviewers from all different um, backgrounds and also some children. And the, I think the most important thing is to find out what the kids think. Uh, and then, and then uh, I will, uh, you know, make a presentation uh, to school boards to, uh, to field test it in one of their schools or, you know, because there are several different boards in, uh, in Ontario. And, um, and, and we'll go from there to see what the response is. And I will document all of this as a research project. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's I think what we'll do. Yeah, there's even a comment on online, grad, like even for online, right? Because a lot of the curriculum now is going online, yeah. especially with COVID, unfortunately. But, you know, the, the possibility is there that we can add links, you know, we can add, you know, buttons, as Carolyn has, has mentioned, you know, we can add, you know, more facts and uh, links to the glossary, right? We have a, a two page glossary of all the terms and Japanese language throughout the book. So, um, you know, that in itself is educational um, for people who are reading. So, well, I think there's a lot of opportunity here, but again, it's just time, it takes time. You know, I'm juggling a lot of projects and Lillian's juggling life and projects. So it's like, um, you know, I've got two young kids, you know, so it's it's one day at a time for us. And, you know, we really respect and, and admire all the, all the beautiful comments that have come through. and. You know, if people have more suggestions, just reach out. You know, we're very accessible. You know, you can find me um, through info at meditatingbunny.com if you want to email or just through my website. Um, and I always respond back. So, yeah, find us on social media. Um, you know, even if you follow me, I'm on Meditating Bunny. Meditating Bunny. Anyways, I'll put it in the comments. Do you want anything, any final thoughts there, Lillian? Yeah, no, you know, Mike, Mike and uh, Natsuki have my email address so that you're quite welcome to share it with people who really want to get in touch, uh, you know, personally. I've had some uh, really, really interesting responses from a lot of um, sensei especially, you know, so I think that's important to, uh, to be able to share that kind of um, uh, communication as well. And we will look to see, you know, what we can uh, accommodate because, of course, everybody's got different views and everything. But then we will look at the ones, you know, that we feel uh, need to be 
changed or altered or whatever. Yeah, and we've taken a lot of those comments to heart so far, and we have made changes and um, revisions. So um, we want to make the, make sure the, be the book is the best it can be, um, because especially if it's being read by you know preteens, um, we want to make sure that um, we're giving them the best book that we can provide them. So that that's that's very much helped from the community. All right, thank you. Um, I believe that's all. Um, we've answered all the questions, so I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, unless there's any final things, um, just want to take a minute to uh, thank the VNCS for um, for hosting and um, and making this possible. We're doing Jeff and Lillian. And um, Jeff and Lillian, thank you, thank you for um, being our guests and um, sharing a bit of um, your your personal art as well as um, into this project. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys. To everybody, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Really great presentation. Thanks. All right. Bye now. Bye now. Bye. Oh. Okay. <laughs> We're just saving the chat here. It's, uh, so saving the chat. <laughs> and I'll hung, hung up. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much, everyone. Umi. You know, she's a, she's a, um, hello? <laughs> okay. Thank you. And Mia Turnbull. <laughs> she, she's one of the artists at the, at the ROM.